Well, good morning, folks. Welcome to beautiful Chelsea, Michigan. We're here at Zion Lutheran Church. Uh, behind me is our cornfield, and uh, I'm excited that you are tuned in uh, with us this morning. Usually what I'd like to do before we begin worship, I like to walk the property, walk around the church, think about what I'm going to be talking about. I uh, pray that the Spirit would be upon us as we gather together to be inspired by His Word and to receive the sacrament. Just be together as God's, uh, God's family. But I'm excited that you are here. We continue our series called Fit for Life, and I'm going to be talking about being financially fit. You know, you might not think Jesus has a lot to say about that, but actually he has a whole lot to say about um, our stuff, uh, our money, how we manage it, how we're supposed to view it, how we're supposed to share it with one another. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that this morning, but I'm just excited that you are here. As you can see, it's going to be a beautiful morning here. Uh, grab a cup of coffee, uh, your Bible, some elements for communion, and we're going to get started uh, with our opening hymn. Again, welcome. As we gather this morning for worship, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, provider of all good things, you bless us with an abundance, God. You give us so much, and we are to enjoy these things, and they are given to us as a blessing so that we can um, not only uh, raise our families, support uh, ourselves, but also that we have these possessions, these things, to be a blessing to others, to share what you have first given to us. So Lord, teach us not to be greedy, but teach us to have a heart, a servant's heart, a heart that is willing to give and to share. As we gather together here, send your Holy Spirit upon us, God, that we can leave this place inspired, fit for life, financially fit as we live out our lives. Bless our time. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Today's reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 24th verse. No one can serve two masters, for a servant will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as we come together and dive in to what it means to be fit for life, we look at all of our blessings, our gifts, our time, our talent, our possessions, and you teach us so much in the scriptures about what we're to do with these things. So open our hearts and our minds and take us to those deeper places so that we can experience the very best that life has to offer. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Uh, I was listening to Dave Ramsey's show uh, on the radio the other day. I don't know if you've ever listened to him, but he's a, a Christian financial guru where he said this. It kind of like stuck in my mind. It says, if you don't learn how to master your money, it will master you. And I thought to myself, you know, there's a whole lot of truth to that statement. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, a whole lot of people and families out there have a difficult time showing mastery over their money. I know it's been a challenge for me throughout my life, which beckons the question, why is it that money is so terribly difficult to master? I mean, think about that just for a minute. You know, the scriptures, Jesus, and when you look at Paul, they have plenty to say when it comes to money and possessions especially when dealing with how we are to view it and use it or, or manage it and the many temptations that come our way when pursuing it. And it's really not so much about the money as much as it is about our faith and our relationship with a loving and generous God and God's desire for you and me to trust in his ways. So that we might, you know, have that life. I say this all the time. So that we might have that life and have that life more abundantly. Jesus actually says that. Money, regardless of whether or not we want to talk about it much in church, is a faith issue. It's a spiritual issue because um, everything that we have, including money, is a stewardship issue. Money is a gift. We know that. It's one of the blessings of life, but it can also be a curse, as we know. In fact, the scripture that we heard in Matthew 6 says this again, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's Jesus. (laughs) So what is it about money? Why do nations go to war over it and business partners split over it and siblings and families fight over it and relationships end over it? Why does the Bible warn us that the love of it is the root of all kinds of evil? I mean, what is this power of money? And that's really what I want to talk a bit about. I want to unpack this morning for you as we continue our series Fit for Life by talking about the power of money. You know, if you think about it, you'll begin to realize that money, more than any other earthly possession, holds out the allure of our attaining godlike sovereignty. And you might be saying, well, what do you mean by that? Well, have you ever wondered what it would be like to be like God? I have. Come on. I mean, I'm sure you have as well. Um, Now think about it. Think about how that would make you feel. I mean, if you were God. I know for myself, we would feel powerful, wouldn't we? We would feel secure. I'm sure that we would feel independent and free and influential and in control. I mean, see, that that was the temptation in the garden with Adam and Eve, wasn't it? Eat the apple, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. That's what Genesis says. Now here's another question to think about to prove my point. If you won $100 million in the lottery next week, which is an unfathomable amount of money, how would that make you feel? Besides saying, oh my God, I just won $100 million bucks. <laughs> I'm sure the money would make you feel a little more powerful than you currently feel. And maybe a little bit more secure about your future 
and maybe a little bit more independent and influential and probably a, a lot more in control, at least on the surface, for a little while. You see, part of the allure of money is that it promises that it will do something for us if we just get more and more and more of it. It, uh, it promises that it's going to give us um, a measure of power and security and freedom and influence. And hey, not all those things are bad, okay? I'm not saying those things are bad because we need a certain amount of power, don't we, and security and freedom and influence if we're going to lead you know, a stable and balanced, healthy life. But here's the deal. Here is where the problem lies, as the scriptures say. It's at this point where there's something inside of us that says, I just don't want a little bit of power and security and freedom and influence. Like, I want tons of it. Yeah, think about it. I mean, I want enough money to fundamentally change my feeling of vulnerability and dependence. I want enough money to get the power I need so that I can have my way, not some of the time, but all of the time, or at least most of the time. I want to become so secure that I don't need anybody or anything or have to worry about my future ever again. I want to be so free, free, that no one can put boundaries or limits on my life. I want to have so much influence that, I mean, I can call like all the shots, pull all the strings, and get my agenda done. Mm. And folks, here's the truth. The allure of having lots of power and security and freedom and influence that comes with the acquiring of money, are you ready? Maybe you've never seen it this way, is actually a deep down desire to have godlike status. It is. As hard as that is to accept, strip it away, and that's what we have. I mean, money tempts us to want to become kind of like our own God. You say, th I mean, think about it. If I had enough money and power that goes with it, then I'm the master of my own destiny. And then there's no need for God, is there? And as I said, that was the deal in the garden with Adam and Eve, what was wrong with the apple? They just wanted to be like God, it said. Remember? Having God-like status. The Bible reminds us that this lust after money is one of the deadliest spiritual diseases a person can get infected with. It can wreck a person's life and imperil their eternity. And beyond that, the Bible also says that no matter the amount of money, no amount of money will ever produce that absolute power, that total sense of security, and that unlimited freedom that many of us are looking for. And of course, we know this to be true from personal experience, don't we? I mean, how many of us think of, or can think of someone who was once wealthy and famous, who we thought had everything, then they lost it all and realized they really had nothing? And Proverbs 23 says it like this. Be wise enough not to wear yourself out trying to get rich. Your money can be gone, boom, in a flash. And you've heard the old saying here today, what? Gone tomorrow. The truth is, no amount of money can fix a bad marriage, can it? Or create loving relationships. I mean, no amount of money uh, can bring you that, you know, that inner peace or heal emotional hurts or restore your self-esteem or bring a sense of assurance about life after death. No amount of money can give us what we most need in life. And that's what's so, so stinking tempting about money, isn't it? Money always oversells itself and ultimately never really delivers the goods, does it? And why Jesus says that money is the one power that most tempts us away from God. If you remember when Jesus was tempted, Satan used all of that power and that money stuff to get him to submit to him. God is the only source in the universe that is capable of really giving us that kind of power. God's power in us and through us that is not vulnerable to human forces. Security, I'm talking about God's security in our hearts, about this life and about heaven, the next life. No one can take that away from us. And freedom, 
Jesus says, when I set you free, he says, you are free indeed. Never to be enslaved to anybody or anything ever again, amen. And why St. Augustine once said, one of my favorite theologians, my soul is restless until it rests in you, O Lord. Now there's another allurement that gives money a whole lot of octane, and that's the one that tempts us to arrange our lives around the acquisition acquisition of what I call this and that. The idea that more is best and better and will finally lead us to, you know, that place of inner satisfaction. But we know it's not true. Jesus warned his followers about this deceitfulness of money and the trickery of money. And you see, part of what Jesus had in mind is what we call the never-ending quest for this and that. It's something that plagues most of us, if not all of us, and it begins at a very young age. And I can remember experiencing it maybe for the first time when I was around six years old. Now, when I was six, I had an old beat-up bike, and I remember I was cruising around the neighborhood one day when all of a sudden my best friend came down the driveway with a brand spanking new blue banana seat Schwinn. I mean, that thing was sweet. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I would never ask or want anything else ever. I mean, I would be the happiest old camper on the face of this planet if I could have a bike just like that. Well, on my seventh birthday, my parents got me a brand new blue Schwinn banana seat bike, but mine (laughs) had a water bottle attachment. Remember that? It was nice. And I rode around on that bike like I was it. Woo! For about two weeks. Until the kid down the street cruised by with his brand new mini bike. I mean, that thing was like awesome. And I began to wonder if my bike was the ultimate it in my life. There must be more, I thought. When I was about 15, I saved enough money to buy a brand new Skidoo 9500 Blizzard. I mean, this thing was it, let me tell you. It was the ultimate dream machine. It was the ultimate muscle sled until the next year, of course, when my cousin bought a new black sleek Yamaha phaser with a new monoshock suspension. I mean, wow, you want to talk about awesome. I looked at mine, I looked at his, and then back at mine, and then at his, and remember thinking, this or that, wait a second, this isn't it, that is it. As a sophomore, I remember thinking, if I could just make the varsity baseball team, man, that would be it, stud on campus. I did, but that wasn't it either, because I wasn't stud on campus, that's for sure. It wasn't until I became a senior that I found out what it was. It was being able to date Jennifer McGrath. She was so nice and kind and sweet, pretty. She had blonde hair. And I thought, boy, if I could just date her, that would be it. Hmm. And I don't know, good fortune, sympathy, who knows. I did, but only for a few months before she dumped me. (laughs) So obviously, I wasn't it, right? (laughs) Now, you know why some of us are kind of chuckling? Because we know about this never-ending quest for it, don't we? We remember saying, if I could just get into that college, I would never want anything else. If I could just land that job, work at that company, bear that title, make this amount of money, live in that house, buy that toy, I'm telling you, woohoo, that would be it. I know it. Until, of course, you get it and you go, nah, it's not really it. Hmm. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, how much money do we have to have or toys or stuff until we finally say it is not really it? So the challenge for all of us this morning is have we settled our never-ending quest for it? Or are we just $10,000 away from it? Or are we just that position away from it? Or the car, the vacation away from it? Because the deal is, it really doesn't have anything to do with how much we have or don't have. See, discovering it has nothing to do with 
with all that stuff. It has to do with living in God's will. That's the better life. Living in his hope, trusting in God's love and grace and forgiveness, trusting in God's peace and contentment, God's purpose for your life, and then doing it with all of your heart and doing it in a community with people that you love because it's in serving God and others that we discover real joy and true significance in our lives. That's it. You know what it is? I believe it's seeing our kids learning about the love of Jesus here at Zion. It is providing blankets and socks and clothing for those in our community who are in need and the ministries that we support. It is working for human rights and peace and justice for our brothers and sisters who are in need saying, you do matter to God and God loves you. And we are here as a witness to that. It is going to Puerto Rico and sharing the love and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. It is sharing your time and your talents and money as we continue to grow and envision new ministries that are reaching out and meeting the needs and changing lives. It is the love and support that we feel in this place at Zion and the family and friends that we have in this community, this church here, that means so much to us. And the ultimate is... It is, are you ready? Is knowing that you and I are worthy and are of great value and worth in the eyes of a loving God and that we are purchased for a price, not with precious commodities like silver or gold, but check this out, with the blood of Jesus Christ who freely gave his life for you and me so that we might have life and have that life more abundantly. Amen? That's it. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, Jesus is it. Jesus is it. And you see, those things are free. And they are available to the homeless guy on the street as well as the woman who's on Wall Street. I love what the prophet Isaiah says. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. If you have no money, come and buy and eat and buy and drink wine and milk without money, without cost. God says, Come to me. You know, Jesus says that as well in Matthew. Come to me when you're struggling, when you're burdened, when you're heavy laden. Come to me and I will give you that peace, that rest, that it that you're looking for. And the final allure of money that gives money so much power is its promise to give us a sense of self-worth and importance. You know, deep down within us is a yearning for self-respect. We all want to be respected by other people. I mean, think about it when you were just a, a kid on the playground at school. Remember trying to figure out ways to establish a sense of being a somebody? Remember trying to be the fastest runner, maybe the best jump roper, or maybe the, a cheerleader, or maybe king of the hill, the first one chosen for baseball? See, all of that was an attempt to settle that nagging question deep down within us. Am I okay? And do others think so? I mean, all of us on the playground wanted somehow to feel like we were a somebody. Now, roll the tape 30 or 40 years ahead in a society like the one that we live in. And how do you get to feel like you're a somebody? What do the advertisers tell us? What do we see implied in the media and in the entertainment industry and by society that has been, folks, duped? They tell us we will be a somebody if we live in a certain size house, in the right neighborhood, and wear a certain type of clothing with appropriate labels, drive a certain kind of a car with the right insignias, you know, dine in, in the nice spots and join this club or that club, and vacation in the right places. That's what they say, and a whole lot of other stuff. Well, how are we going to get that all done apart from making and spending a whole lot of money? So what do we do? We arrange our lives around a mad scramble for that which we think will someday help us feel like a somebody, only to realize that in spite of all of the energy we invested and all the money that we made and spent and all the symbols we have surrounded ourselves in, guess what? We still don't feel any different about ourselves than we did as little kids on that playground. Am I right? And what about all those people we thought who were going to respect us along the way. You know, sooner or later, 
We have to call this whole deal precisely what Solomon called it back in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity, which is one of the deadly sins. It's all vanity. The Bible says it's like chasing the wind. You will spend a lifetime doing this and that and coming up with zero. Chasing money is like chasing the wind, he says. It's all vanity. It will never make you a somebody. It's a dead-end road. But instead, I want to challenge you this morning. Open your heart and your mind to your true worth. I want you to hear this loud and clear, because some of you might not feel this way. You are a somebody because of Jesus Christ and what he did for you. I don't care where you find yourself or what you've done. You're his chosen one, hmm. who is highly favored, his beloved, the apple of his eye, a masterpiece, someone who was worth dying for. You are a somebody, Jesus says. So be aware of the allure and the power of money, because rarely does it deliver what it promises. It will never make you completely secure or satisfy your soul, and it will never make you really feel like a somebody. Because only God can do those things. Because our souls are indeed restless until they rest in you, O Lord. God, thank you so much for reminding us that we are loved deeply and that ultimate satisfaction and peace and contentment and all the things that our hearts desire can be found in you. Continue, Lord, to teach us that money is a gift, it's a treasure but it's to be used and to, in ways that, yes, we provide for ourselves and we can enjoy life, but it's also to be used to, to give away, to help others. May we not, Lord, um, go after money in ways that pulls us from you. Teach us to be good stewards, financially fit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. We continue with, the hymn. Before we begin communion, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, 
My peace I give you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, but my peace that I give to you. So very often we're searching and seeking for that peace. Very often uh, we don't find it. But Jesus reminds us that peace is a spiritual gift, and Jesus is the one, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us that, and peace is always a good thing. I know in my own personal life, uh, I need lots of peace. So much noise out there, uh, and in here sometimes, and up here sometimes. So may the peace of the Lord be with you today and in your week that lies ahead as well. Also, I want to thank you for your uh, generosity uh, thank you for continuing to give and to share. Because of that, lives are being changed locally and throughout the world. So if you want to continue to support our ministry, you can soon, uh, do so by uh, mailing your uh, offering in, or you can go to our website and cl uh, click on the donate button. But we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for supporting uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ here at Zion. Let's pray and prepare our hearts for communion as Jesus comes to us, the Prince of Peace. Good and gracious God, uh, we think of the world in which we live, and it can be a crazy place sometimes. So many demands, so many voices competing for our attention. But the one thing that is necessary is to remove the clutter and hear your voice, because you are the Good Shepherd. And you give us the comfort and the strength and the hope and the life and the peace that we all desire. Thank you for establishing this meal, a very intimate and special way that you come to us in this bread and wine. We believe, God, it's a mystery of our faith, but we believe that you are truly physically present when we eat of this meal. And that's always a good thing because it reminds us that we never are alone in this world. At times, it might seem that way, but we know that you are a constant presence and source of strength. So Lord, open our hearts and our minds as we gather here to feel the prompting of your Holy Spirit, to feel that intimacy that our hearts desire, to get to know you, God, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all of them to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, it's for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this for the remembrance of me, Jesus. Lord, thank you for gathering us here on this beautiful morning. That we can come and we can worship you to give you thanks call upon you in time of need, but also to give you thanks. Thank you for teaching us the importance of prayer. And together, we pray that prayer that you taught your disciples so long ago, trusting in the words that we are praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to continue with communion. And this is an opportunity for you to commune uh, knowing that the Lord is present, but also being mindful that you are part of a community here that extends not only to the ends of the earth, but connects us to heaven as well. And Jesus is the center of that community. And he's the one that can give us that peace and give us that stability uh, that we so often are looking for. So we're going to continue with communion, knowing that Jesus 
is present, giving us his body and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, but also uh, reminding us of that resurrection hope and reminding us that he will come again. We continue with communion. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. I will end each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be made known to all peoples. We remember our sisters and brothers in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in Uganda, and our companion synods in Jordan and Tanzania. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You laid the foundations of the earth and the waters are the womb of all creation. The morning stars sing your name, and all creation shouts for joy. We pray for your blessed creation, that it may continue to flourish and magnify your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experiencing violence, hunger, and unrest, especially Myanmar, Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. Guide worldwide and local community organizations in their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are close to the brokenhearted and near to those in distress. We pray for those who are experiencing oppression. Liberate us from systems and chains that bind us. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. We remember the end of slavery in our country on Juneteenth and repent of the prejudice and bias that still occurs throughout our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for our leaders and elders, our church council, our staff, and the committees who help carry out ministries. Grant them knowledge, patience, and kindness, that through their leadership, 
you may be exalted in this assembly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Spirit of comfort, we lift up those who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. Keep them aware of your presence and bring them relief of pain and affliction. Bless and strengthen family, friends, and all caregivers. We lift up those on our prayer list and those on our hearts, whom we name aloud or silently. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and for fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his love and his grace always. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us. I hope that you felt inspired, that you felt the love of Jesus here, that uh, I gave you maybe some nuggets uh, to think about this next week when it comes to being uh, financially fit, and I hope that you have a, an awesome week. If you're looking for a faith community, Zion's a wonderful place. We have so many ministries here uh, for all ages, uh, opportunities to grow in your faith, or if you want to serve, multiple ways that we reach out to our community and to the ends of the earth with the gospel, uh, ways that uh, we can make a difference and impact uh, people's lives, knowing that God deeply loves them. Uh, we'd love for you to, uh, to join us. Uh, give us a call. Check out the website, uh, or you can uh, check out our Facebook. If you want to uh, sit down and have a conversation about spiritual things, or maybe you're investigating the tenets of, of being a follower of Jesus, man, I would love to hang out with you and uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, other than that, I uh, hope that you join us next week, same time, same place. If you would like to join us in person, you can do that as well. During the summer, we're worshiping at 1030. Uh, we'd love for you to, to come here and meet the wonderful people here at Zion. Other than that, I hope that you have a great week. Go out and make it a great week. And remember that God loves you deeply. I want to send you off with a blessing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Shalom in Hebrew, meaning total well-being, mind, body, spirit, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See you next week.
as passionate, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, let's go out into the world and tell everyone what God has done for us. Thanks be to God. Have a great week, everyone.